Hey everyone, this video is about ambiguity in linguistics, which is when we say things that can have more than one meaning. I'm Aaron from Finktum Languages, and just so you know, this video is part of a larger series about the basics of linguistics. To see other videos about the science of language, you can check out the link up here or in the description below. When something is ambiguous, it's open to more than one interpretation, or it can have a double meaning, as in this sentence. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. So ambiguity causes confusion, and there's a lot of different types of ambiguity in linguistics. Here's a list of a few different types we're going to cover in this video, and they range from lexical ambiguity, which is when a word can have more than one meaning, to syntactic ambiguity, which is when you can make several different syntax trees out of the same sentence. Probably the simplest type of ambiguity is at the level of the individual word. The word bar can mean either a pub or a pole, which gives this sentence a few different possible interpretations. And this type of ambiguity is also what makes puns funny, if you're the kind of person who thinks puns are funny. We talked about lexical ambiguity briefly in the last video I made for this series. That video was all about what's called lexical semantics, which just means it has to do with the meaning of vocabulary words. Figurative ambiguity is also easy to understand. That's when a sentence can have a literal meaning as well as a figurative meaning, such as, I am titanium, or baby, you're a firework. Of course, when Sia sings, I am titanium, we don't literally take it to mean she's made out of metal. It's figurative, and we come to this conclusion based entirely on context. If Robocop were to say the same thing, we might take him to be speaking literally. In morphological ambiguity, the hierarchy of morphemes within a word is not clear, such as in the word unlockable, which could mean either able to be unlocked or unable to be locked, which mean two very different things. Either way, the root of the word is lock, but there's also the prefix un and the suffix able, and there's no hint here to tell us which affix should be viewed as more central to the meaning of the word unlockable. Take a minute to look at these diagrams below, and it should make it clear how the meaning of the word unlockable changes as the internal hierarchy of the morphemes changes. For more information on this, check out my Morphology 101 video. Scope ambiguity is a really interesting one. It's something that causes confusion in our everyday conversations. For example, the sentence, every hobbit fought a goblin, could mean a few different things. Let's just assume for a minute that there are four hobbits present in the battle that we're talking about. This sentence could mean that all four of them were ganging up on one poor lonely goblin. Or it could mean that there were four goblins, each being fought by one hobbit. The ambiguity here comes because there are two quantifiers, and we don't know which one is more important to the meaning of the sentence. The word every is a quantifier that tells us we're dealing with 100% of the items in a set. In this case, the set of hobbits in the battle. And the word a is a quantifier that tells us we're dealing with at least one item. And one of these two quantifiers is more pivotal to the meaning of the sentence, or in other words, it has a bigger scope. Take a look at the word every for a moment. Since this word indicates 100% of something, it tells us that all of the hobbits present must be in battle with a goblin. And if there's even one hobbit slacking off in the corner not fighting, the whole sentence is a dang lie. If the word every has a bigger scope than the word a, we should pay most attention to the fact that 100% of the hobbits are fighting some goblin or another. It doesn't matter whether they're all fighting the same one or different ones. And if that's the case, we can think of the sentence like this. In the case of every hobbit, there is at least one goblin that he is fighting. The circles here represent which quantifier has the bigger scope. So what happens if the word a has a bigger scope than the word every? Well, the word a is used to tell us that at least one individual exists. So if a has a bigger scope, we first recognize that there's one goblin, and then with that in mind, we recognize that this individual goblin is being fought by every hobbit. And again, these circles can clear up the ambiguity of the sentence, but we don't pronounce the circles when we're speaking. And without them, we just don't know which quantifier has the bigger scope. That's why the sentence is ambiguous. 
Structural ambiguity is another fun one, and the Syntax 101 videos I did for this series might help clear up some confusion if you don't quite understand what's going on here. Structural ambiguity is when we have a single string of words on the surface of a sentence that could potentially have multiple different syntax trees on deeper levels of the sentence. A good example of this is when Groucho Marx says, I once shot an elephant in my pajamas. And of course, the rest of the joke is, how he got in my pajamas, I don't know. So I've drawn here a simplified syntax tree of the most probable interpretation of this sentence. Notice how in this interpretation, we have two big sections of the tree that are branching down from the verb phrase. We have the prepositional phrase, in my pajamas, and the V-bar, shot an elephant. They work together to form the entire verb phrase, shot an elephant in my pajamas. And the two sections are connected together at the top of the VP. If you're confused, I'll slow it down a little. Just look at the prepositional phrase, in my pajamas. In this interpretation of the sentence, the prepositional phrase acts kind of like an adverb because it tells us something about how you shot the elephant. You're saying, I shot an elephant and here's how I did it. I was in my pajamas. And the two branches of the section come together up here at the verb phrase. That's very important because there's another interpretation of the sentence where the prepositional phrase doesn't modify the verb. It modifies the noun elephant. And that interpretation would look something like this. See how the prepositional phrase is no longer attached to the verb? And the entire phrase, an elephant in my pajamas, serves as the direct object to the verb shot. Of course, when we draw out the syntax trees, it's crystal clear which interpretation we meant. It's not ambiguous. But again, we don't pronounce syntax trees when we're speaking. We just assume people will be able to figure out which interpretation of the sentence is more likely. And in this case, it's probably pretty easy to figure that out because we know elephants can't fit into people's pajamas. But this knowledge is what we call extra linguistic information, meaning that there's nothing about the sentence or the words in the sentence itself that can help us come to this conclusion. Now let's contrast that with a very similar structural ambiguity, like in the sentence, Indiana Jones killed a man with a sword. We don't know where to attach the prepositional phrase with a sword. So this sentence is just as ambiguous as the last one, but it's more likely to be confusing because we can't rely on extra linguistic information like our knowledge that elephants don't wear pajamas. There's nothing about the nature of Indiana Jones that tells us whether he's more likely to use a sword or to kill a man who has a sword. So while this sentence is another example of structural ambiguity, it's also what we call pragmatic ambiguity. Pragmatics is a subfield of linguistics that studies how context contributes to meaning. And we're gonna do a whole video later in this series about pragmatics, so stay tuned for that. Pragmatic ambiguity occurs when context does not provide enough information to clarify the statement. So this can actually cover over a bunch of the other different types of ambiguity that we've covered in this video. Speech act ambiguity is what happens when it's not clear what a speaker is trying to accomplish with their sentence. For example, when you say, can you pass the maple syrup? Are you just asking for information about the other person's physical capability to pass food? Or are you requesting for them to do so? Anytime we utter a sentence, we're using it to try to accomplish something. A sentence could fall under any of these categories and many other types, and each one is meant to accomplish a different task although it's not always 100% clear which category your sentence would fall under. For example, the sentence, I'm sorry, often serves as an apology for something that you did wrong. But if you say it at a funeral, hopefully it's just an expression of condolence, not an apology for something that you did wrong. Now, everything we've talked about in this video is stuff you'll need to pay attention to if you're learning a foreign language, and learning about linguistics will be really helpful, so don't stop here. Check out my other linguistics videos so you can finally learn that language because a new language will enhance your life. I'll see you guys next time.